All right, everybody have a good lunch? Good. It's okay, come on in. All right, we are going to get started with our next session, Hooked on a Feeling, Living by God's Word Instead of Our Emotions. I was going to ask how many of y'all knew that song. If you don't know that song, that Hooked on a Feeling, you can Google it. Just Google Uga Chaka, Uga Chaka. It's, it's always nice. <laughs> It's always nice when there's people my age in the audience because <laughs> sometimes I go someplace and I'll say something like something about the Fonz or something like that and these 20-year-olds have no idea. <laughs> I'm like, okay, new illustration for that one. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, it's fun being an older woman in the church, isn't it? All right. So have you noticed that a lot of people today, both inside and outside the church, seem to live life as though they're being led around by the nose by their feelings. Uh-huh. Think of some examples you've seen, maybe just in society in general, or maybe an example that you've seen personally of a situation in which someone is letting her feelings dictate what she does in life. For example, being in love can cause you to do some pretty stupid things and make some pretty stupid decisions, yes? Uh, it can cause you to give up your virginity before marriage. Uh, it can cause you to do things that you know are wrong and so on. Um, you know, like every episode of Dateline starts that way, right? I just loved him so much, I never dreamed he would rob six banks and I would be the getaway driver, you know? <laughs> Anger. Anger can cause you to say hurtful things and can cause you to make rash decisions. Uh, what about a girl who feels like she's a boy and begins living life pretending like she's a boy? These are some examples of people making decisions based on their feelings. And where do our feelings, metaphorically speaking, come from? The heart. And we hear phrases like, the heart wants what it wants, right? <laughs> Follow your heart. Broken hearted. From the bottom of my heart. With a heavy heart. And if you're Celine Dion on the Titanic, <laughs> my heart will go on. I'm, I'm not going to sing it for you, don't worry. <laughs> so we hear phrases like this all the time, and then we get to the Bible. And what does the Bible say about our hearts? That, that's right. That is right. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, doesn't that just stomp all over our precious little romantic notions of the heart and our feelings? So as Christians, what it boils down to, as with almost everything else in the Christian life, is this, the world tells us one thing, the Bible tells us something else. Which one are we going to believe and obey? Now, we're all good little Sunday school girls in here. We know the right Christian answer to give to that question is, well, of course, we're going to believe and obey the Bible. And that should be a no-brainer, although we're starting to hear <laughs> remarks from people who claim to be Christians that, that are attempting to unravel this most basic of Christian concepts. Listen to this quote I heard a couple of years ago. This quote, very interesting. She says, when my religion tries to come between me and my neighbor, I will choose my neighbor. That self-canceling feature of my religion is one of the things I like best about it. Jesus, you didn't know she was talking about Christianity, did you? Jesus never commanded me to love my religion. And this is just a perfect example of living by our feelings. This is a quote from the book Holy Envy 
Finding God in the Faith of Others, written by Barbara Brown Taylor, who eventually, before walking away from the church altogether, was for many years an Episcopal priest. I mean, this quote and the woman herself are just a study in living by your feelings. She says, when my religion, and her religion supposedly is Christianity, she says, when my religion comes between me and my neighbor, okay, hold it right there. Does Christianity ever come between you and your neighbor? No, I'm glad to hear you say that. Uh, certainly not to the point where you have to put Christianity aside in order to do right by your neighbor, right? No, Christianity is all about laying your life down for your neighbor, serving your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself. The Bible says so in John 15, 13 and Luke 10, 25 to 37. I, I should have all those scripture references down there for you. But because of her feelings for her neighbor and her feelings about what the Bible says, she has decided that if she ever feels like Christianity is forcing her to choose between God's word and her neighbor, she's going to choose her neighbor. <clears throat> and then the title of Barbara's book is Holy Envy. Can envy ever be holy? No, the Bible says so in Mark 7, 21 to 23. It says that, e that envy is a sin. And Isaiah 5, 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. But she feels it can be holy. And the remainder of the title is Finding God in the Faith of Others. And if you read the book description, she's not talking about finding out how God is working the lives of your brothers and sisters in Christ. She is talking about finding God in Buddhism and Hinduism and whateverism because she feels like you can find God in those religions, even though the Bible says in John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through him. And then Barbara walked away from the church and whatever version of Christianity she was practicing at that time because she felt like it, even though the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, that we are not to forsake gathering together. And then we've got the fact that Barbara is a priest, which, as a woman, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 12, that she is not to do. But Barbara became a priest because she felt like she wanted to be a priest. Do you sense that tension between I feel and the Bible says? Yes, it's almost palpable. And do you see how in every decision that Barbara made to follow her feelings, she first had to reject what the Bible plainly says? That is something we have got to wrap our minds around and be sure that we're not doing. That's what's going on in the church and in the hearts and lives of so many evangelical women today. <coughs> now, just to be clear, nobody is saying it's wrong or unbiblical to have feelings or to have emotions or to express your emotions as long as you're doing it in a godly way. God created us with emotions. Jesus, we talked about earlier, Jesus expressed a wide variety of emotions when he was here on earth. So we know that simply having emotions or expressing those emotions in a non-sinful way is not wrong. What we're talking about here is letting your emotions control your life and your decisions. Letting your feelings lead you. It could be decisions as big as who you're going to marry or whether or not to buy a house or something as everyday as deciding to keep your mouth shut when you, what you really feel like you wanna do is to feel that fleshly gratification of having that perfect comeback that would really put that lady in her place, right? Or, you know, deciding to take care of your responsibilities around the house when what you really feel like doing is sitting around and watching TV all day. We live in a world where people are letting their feelings run their lives. And it's pretty easy to see in, for example, a man who feels like he's a woman and is mutilating his body in hopes of making that a reality. Um, 
But look how subtly it's creeping into the church and even into our own hearts without us even realizing it. So the first thing we've got to address when we tackle this issue, and we've already touched on it a little bit, is why should we live by God's word word, instead of our emotions? And where do you think we're going to find the answer to that question? In the Bible, that's right. All right, so we've already looked at Jeremiah 17.9, but let's quickly go back over that and review it. Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Okay, I don't know about you, but I think that's a pretty good argument for not following your heart or for living your life by your feelings. It makes sense logically, right? Why would anyone let something sick and deceitful lead her through life? Any thinking person would say, that's a recipe for disaster. And then it makes sense experientially. We know from experience that our hearts can lead us astray. And then it makes sense authoritatively. God is the maker of your heart and your emotions, and he says not to follow it because it's deceitful. So we need to obey him simply because he's God. So we know that we shouldn't be following our hearts. But human beings are created to be followers. That's just how God wired us. We all follow something as our God in life. And if it's not going to be our heart, then what should we be following? Well, the human heart craves stability and assurance. We want an unchanging standard, something that we can bet our lives on. We long for something that won't let us down, that we can trust in every circumstance. Well, guess what? There's a God for that, okay? Our hearts were uniquely created to follow God. And when you follow God, he is your authority. He is your master. He calls the shots. It's the same way with whatever you follow. If you follow your feelings, your feelings are your authority. Your feelings are your master. Your feelings call the shots. 2 Peter 2, 19b says this, For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Now, Peter is talking about this in the context of being enslaved to sin and false doctrine. But this principle is really true in any context, if you think about it. Whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. If your emotions have conquered you, you are enslaved to your emotions. But if your flesh has been conquered by Christ and he has saved you, you are enslaved to him. Romans 6.22 says, You have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. Being a slave of God is a wonderful thing. We tend to think of slavery in terms of American slavery in the antebellum South, which was, had very negative connotations, and rightly so. But when Paul says this in Romans about being slaves of God, his audience would have had a very different understanding of slavery than we do. In biblical times, people often sold themselves into slavery because of debt. If you went into debt and you couldn't pay it back, You were going to have people coming after you to throw you in debtor's prison or to take your home and to leave you homeless and indigent and starving or just other terrible things like that. And selling yourself into slavery was a way to pay off your debt and at the same time ensure that you still had a home and food and clothing. And in many cases, masters educated their slaves and a slave could work his way up in rank and authority in the household and even eventually obtain his freedom if he wished. So what Paul is saying here is that God has come along, and at the cost of the life of his only son, he bought us out of the sin debt that was so huge that we would never be able to pay it back, a sin debt that we were about to be dragged off to the debtor's prison of hell for. And he has brought us into his home, cleaned us up, given us food and shelter, and clothed us in the righteous royal robes of Christ. And not only that, he he has made all of those riches eternally secure by adopting us into his family and making us his sons and daughters, joint heirs 
with Christ. That's our master. Not some evil tyrant, but a good, loving, caring, providing God. Why would you not want to be a slave of that master? Because you're going to be a slave to something, either to yourself or to Christ. And Christ is a much better master. I think we can all agree on that. But the thing about a master-slave relationship is that the master has authority over the slave. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says this, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. You are bought and paid for, my friend. You don't work for the master of self anymore. Self doesn't get to boss you around anymore. You have a new master, Christ. You do what he says now. And don't let that scare you, because when you traded self as master for Christ as master, you traded way up, way up. Because remember what we read earlier in Jeremiah, your old master was deceitful and desperately sick and unknowable. But everything Christ tells you to do is good and right and perfect. Everything Christ tells you to do is for your good and for his glory. Remember that stability we were talking about earlier, you know, that people just naturally crave? This is part of that stability. You never have to worry whether the thing that God is telling you to do is the right thing to do or if it's the best thing for you. You can trust that it is every single time. And where do we find all of these things that God is telling us to do? We find them in his written word, the Bible. So we don't live by our emotions because they are deceptive and untrustworthy. We live by God's word because he is our master. And there's another very important reason to live by God's word instead of our emotions. Because living by God's word is the perfect example that Jesus set for us. We're going to take a look at Matthew 4, 1 through 11. If you want to turn there, we're going to be there for just a minute. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. This is Jesus being tempted by Satan in the wilderness. Matthew 4, 1 through 11, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Wouldn't you be, right? How many of y'all have ever fasted before? Maybe it was to fast and pray. Maybe you were going to have a medical procedure and they told you not to eat for 12 hours before or something like that. Has anybody ever fasted before? Yeah. The longest I've ever intentionally fasted was 24 hours. And I thought I was going to die. Uh, (laughs) I don't know if you're like me, but when I don't eat for an extended period of time, it's not just the physical hunger pangs. It affects my clarity of thought, you know, my emotions, everything. I hear those amens. So I I can't even imagine how Jesus must have been feeling after 40 days of not eating. Verse 3. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Verse 4, but he answered, It is written. Now before we move on to the next part of that verse, what does Jesus mean by it is written? Who wrote it? Where is it written? The Bible, that's right, in Scripture. And just something else I'd like to briefly point out here in this passage, you'll notice that he doesn't say, God told me, or I heard a still small voice, or I just feel like God is saying to me, or God spoke to me in a dream and said blah, blah, blah. No. What does he say? He says, it is written. Okay. Why is that instructive to us? Because most of the time when people say these things, you know, I just feel like God is saying to me or whatever, that's based on their feelings which we've already said can be deceptive and wicked and untrustworthy. But it's based on their feelings rather than the objective, concrete, black and white, incontrovertible word of God. All right, 
Back to verse 4. It is written, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Let me read that again. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what are we not to live by? Bread alone, that's right. Jesus felt hungry. Maybe he felt like giving up on this fast and eating something. Maybe he felt like he wanted some bread. But he says we are not to allow ourselves and our decisions to be controlled by our feelings. We are not to live by bread alone, but what are we to live by? That's right, every word that comes from the mouth of God. And where do we find every word that comes from the mouth of God? We find it in Scripture. It is written. All right, verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Satan's getting in on the it is written thing here. He will command his angels concerning you and... On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now, if you'll allow me to indulge my inner archaeology nerd for a moment, in Herod's temple, which is the temple that Jesus would have known, there was a pinnacle on one of the buildings of, in the temple complex, which stood 300 feet above the valley that was below it, the Kidron Valley. And that is a drop almost equivalent to jumping off a 28-story building, okay? At our state capitol in Baton Rouge, you can go up to the 27th floor, and there's an open-air observatory where, or observation deck where you can walk around and look out across the Mississippi River and look out across Baton Rouge and all that. And for someone like me who's afraid of heights, it's terrifying. <laughs> jumping off the pinnacle of the temple would not have tempted me at all. Now, the temple was the center of life in Jerusalem. There were always people around, especially the people who most antagonized Jesus, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the priests. <clears throat> so what Satan is saying to Jesus here, what he's tempting him to do, is to throw himself off this basically 28-story building and trust that God would miraculously catch him on the way down and not let him fall to his death. And then everybody would see that, and everybody would believe in him, especially the scribes and the Pharisees who were always hanging around the temple complex. Now, remember, Jesus is the author of Scripture, so he had already written about himself Isaiah 53, 700 years ago by this time. And in, in that passage, he says he, Jesus, was despised and rejected by men. And of course, in addition to all of that, you know, him being the author of scripture and everything, uh, as God, he's omniscient. So Jesus already knows what he's in for. Rejection, hatred, people impugning his character and calling him names, people wanting to kill him. He knows he's in for all that. And so Satan is appealing to Jesus' desire to feel liked and accepted by doing something glamorous and sparkly. And maybe Satan's even appealing to Jesus' desire to take an easier way out for people to believe in him, an easier way than scourging and a crown of thorns and a cross. Jumping off the temple and having angels catch you on the way down so you don't even strike your foot against a stone is certainly a lot easier and awesomer than the pain and the humiliation of the cross. But does Jesus give in to those feelings of, wanting to be liked or wanting to take the easy way out and let those feelings determine his actions? No. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, with it is written, he says, I'm not going to test God that way. And by the way, since I'm God, you ought not be testing me this way either. I'm not going to let my feelings cause me to do something I know is wrong. All right, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. What is it with the devil and heights? The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and, its glory, and their glory. 
And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Who wouldn't want global power and the wealth that comes with it if it were offered to him? So Satan kind of comes at him with, you're a king, Jesus, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Doesn't that kind of a king deserve to have the whole world as his kingdom? You know, forget about Judgment Day. Don't you deserve everyone to love you and respect you and bow down to you and obey you right now? Now, as women, just because of the way God has wired us a little bit differently from men, we probably don't feel the weight of this quite as much as men would. That temptation to feel powerful and respected that can be much more impactful to men than to women. So men can be tempted to live by their feelings too, but they generally tend to be tempted in a little bit different way than women are. Verse 10, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So again, it is written. <clears throat> Jesus is not going to give in to his feelings and desires, no matter how tempting it may be. He is our perfect example of living by God's word instead of by our emotions. So we started off this first segment with the question, why should we live by God's word instead of by, by our emotions? Because our emotions are deceitful and wicked and untrustworthy because God and his word are good and perfect and trustworthy, because if we are in Christ, he is our master, not self, and we're to do what he says, not what our emotions say, and because Jesus not only tells us to live, not to live by our emotions, he set the perfect example for us by not living by his emotions, but by living by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Are those good enough reasons to live by God's word instead of by our emotions? I think so. So now that we know why we should live by God's word instead of our emotions, how do we do that? So let's look at how to live by God's word instead of our emotions. All right. Number one. Determine in your spirit that you're going to do it. In other words, make a non-emotional, objective, biblical decision that you're going to live by God's words instead of by your emotions. If you're like me, it helps to make a conscious decision to start doing something. Write it down, tell your husband or your best friend about it, even just say it out loud in your prayer time or to yourself. Y'all remember in the Old Testament when something significant would happen and they would set up a memorial stone to remember it by, a stone of remembrance? Making that kind of conscious decision is kind of like that. It's, It's something you can point back to later, you know, when you're tempted to live by your emotions and say, no, I'm not gonna do that. I made a decision to live by God's word, not by my emotions. So that's the first thing you can do. Number two, pray. Ask God to help you. You know, so often we treat sanctification, growing in Christ-likeness, like it's a do-it-yourself project. You know, it's, it's not. Sometimes we, we feel like if we really want to show God that we love him, that we have to prove it by obeying him in our own strength. But that's exactly the opposite of what God wants. God doesn't see you being strong and independent and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps as successful. God sees you totally depending on him as successful. You don't have to attempt living by God's word or anything else in the Christian life by yourself. And you're not going to be able to do it anyway. So just give it up and ask for God's help to live by his word when you're tempted to live by your emotions. That is a godly, righteous prayer, and God delights to answer the prayers of his children when they're asking him to help them to be more godly. So be sure to be in prayer. Number three, 
Identify your weaknesses. <clears throat> when are you most likely to live by your emotions? Certain time of day, certain time of the month, in certain circumstances, with certain people. Also ask yourself, which emotions are you most likely to be controlled by? Anger, love, sadness, fear, excitement, jealousy. This is going to take some introspection. So if you have some trouble pinpointing your triggers by just sitting and thinking about it, you might want to journal about it. Carry around a little notepad or use the notes feature of your phone and make a note of the circumstances every time you feel tempted to let your emotions control you. Or, you know, sit down for a minute at night and think back over the day and write everything down then. Ask God to reveal to you your areas of weakness. Maybe even ask your husband or a really close friend who will be honest with you what they see your weaknesses to be as far as choosing your emotions over God's word. The more clearly you can define a problem, the easier it is to deal with it and pray about it in a specific and efficient way. And also the less monumental and impossible it seems to tackle it. All right, number four, memorize scripture. Yes, you can, okay? I, I used to say I couldn't memorize too, but I started working on it. I found a way that works for me. And if I can do it, anybody can do it, okay? You just have to find a system that works for you. Think back to the passage that we just read about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. The devil brought temptations to him, and how did Jesus combat those temptations? With memorized scripture. What are some scriptures that you th can think of that would be helpful to memorize so that when you're tempted to act <clears throat> on your emotions, you can recite that scripture to combat that temptation? On your hand out there, I've listed some, some real general ones about not living by your emotions and living by God's word instead. Um, if you find that you're tempted to live by your emotions in a specific area like eating to feel better or feeling attracted to a man that you're not married to or venting your, <clears throat> your anger to feel better, uh, I would encourage you to find verses specifically about gluttony or lust or anger or whatever and memorize those as well. All right, number five, cut off your right hand, gouge out your right eye. And obviously, I don't mean those things literally any more than Jesus meant it literally when he said it. But let's look at that. That's in Matthew 5, 29 through 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. And another verse that goes along with that is Romans 13, 14. It says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. In other words, get rid of anything that makes it easier for you to give in to temptation to sin. Okay? Rearrange whatever details of your life that you have to um, to make it as difficult as possible for you to sin. Okay? For example, let's say that you're really into news and politics, and that's mostly what makes up your face Facebook feed. And after you've scrolled through Facebook for an hour, you're just livid at what's going on in the world. And because you're livid at what's going on in the world, you start snapping at your family members to vent your frustration. That's living by your emotions. Living by God's word requires you to love and serve your family and to be patient and kind with them. So you need to gouge out that eye or cut off that hand and maybe either stop following those news and politics accounts or you may even need to get off Facebook completely. It can be done. If, you know, if you've got to do those things if you cannot stop allowing your emotions to control you. Another example. Let's say when you've had a really hard day, it makes you feel better to go shopping. 
and the mall is right there on your way home from work. But your husband has asked you not to do that anymore because it's not in the family budget. Living by God's word in Ephesians 5 requires you to submit to your husband and not to go on those shopping trips anymore. But driving past that mall is really tempting. So drive home a different direction. Go a couple of blocks out of your way, um, and that's worth it to resist temptation. We need to obey God's word and to show love and respect for your husband. It's worth it. Number six, make a plan ahead of time. How often do you respond really well when something unexpected happens? Maybe you're better at that than I am, or when you're not prepared for something. I'm not good about that. Once you've identified your weaknesses and the situations that sort of trigger you to give in to your emotions, sit down and make a plan for how to respond the next time you're tempted. It could be like what we just talked about with cutting off your right hand, gouging out your right eye. When I've had a bad day, I am not going to drive past the mall on my way home from work. When I'm feeling myself getting frustrated by politics, I'm going to put down the Facebook machine. Okay? But it could also be something smaller and simpler. You know, uh, when that lady at work makes me angry, I'm going to step out of the room for a minute until I can calm down and act in a godly way. When my kids are fussy or arguing or getting on my nerves and I feel like yelling, I'm going to take a deep breath, I'm going to say my memory verse, and I'm going to say a short prayer asking God to help me to be patient. Here's something I do. I struggle, you're not going to believe this, I struggle with the temptation to argue the stupidest things right into the ground with my husband because I want to feel right. I want to feel like I've won. I'm sure nobody else in here has that feeling. And so what I started doing was every time that I felt that temptation, I tried to remember to do this. Like literally, and I mean like I clamp down hard on the insides of my lips so it's, it's impossible for me to say anything. And I do that until that moment of temptation passes and While I'm doing that, I'm also saying a little prayer that God will help me to keep my mouth shut and to be godly in that situation. And I fail at that more times than I succeed, I think, but it has helped. And then, of course, my husband figured out what I was doing. And, um, but I think he appreciates me not saying whatever it was I was going to say and that I'm trying to do the godly thing. So little things like that. Make a plan and work your plan. If it's a recurring type of situation, you might even want to get somebody to help you to role play the situation so you know you can practice the right response in advance. That might sound silly, but it really does help. <clears throat> the idea here is responding in a godly way instead of reacting. To stop just reacting out of emotion and instead Take the time to make sure that you respond out of obedience to God's word. Number seven, keep a record. As you're beginning to work on living by God's word instead of living by your emotions, write all this stuff down and be sure to write the dates down too. Write down all of these things that we've been talking about, your weaknesses and your triggers to giving in to your emotions your little plans and your little strategies for dealing with temptation, the Bible verses that you're working on memorizing, uh, the times that you sin and repent, and the times that you obey God and give him glory for that. Write down, you know, about your prayers for all of these things and how God answers. Write all this stuff down. Write down the dates. It'll help you to remember the things that you need to remember. And then from time to time, it is really joyful to go back and read over what you've written. It'll help you to see how God is working in your life and how he has grown you. Our hearts, the seed of our emotions, are deceptive and desperately sick and untrustworthy. We don't want something like that leading us through life. We want to be led by God's true, right, trustworthy 
word. And if we'll determine in our spirits that we want to live by God's word, if we will make no provision for the flesh, but make plans for obedience instead, and if we will depend on Christ to help us every step of the way, he will grow us in greater Christ likeness to live by his word and not by our emotions. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us emotions. Thank you that, um, that we can feel and that you've given us such a wide variety of emotions. And please help us, Father, to, to harness those with your word and to, um, to respond to situations in a godly way.